the story that I'm here to tell tonight is in some ways a really difficult story, and it won't be very funny, at least parts of it. Um, but it's also, like any good story, a story that's hopeful, and it's about perseverance and courage. And it's a story that begins for me with these two women, who are the co-founders of Kofaviv, a women's organization in Haiti that works with 3,000 members across the country who've all been victims of sexual violence. Um, there's a history of sexual violence in Haiti and that they know personally. Both Malia and Aramit were raped while their husbands were tortured and left to die because of their political beliefs during the military coup in the early 1990s. There's a history of violence in, um, in Haiti during different military coups, during political unrest. I think that's longer than 15 seconds, but there's a history of this violence that's taken place in Haiti, um, really from the beginning of the revolution and um, through recent years. But Haitian women haven't just been victims. They've also organized and fought against, this, um, against these problems. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so, so they've organized and they've achieved some really important victories. In 2005, they changed the status of rape from being a crime of passion to being an actual criminal offense. They've organized meetings, they've set up safe houses across the country, and they've... Um, <laughs> so a year ago, in January 2010, a lot of those victories were removed when the earthquake happened. They lost their loved ones, they lost their jobs, Many were moved into camps where their living conditions deteriorated severely. In the camps, problems of sexual violence have become rampant over the past year. In the first 100 days after the earthquake, um, over 200 rapes were recorded in just 15 of the camps, and unfortunately those numbers have only increased over the past year. And the pattern of rapes have changed. While often there have been waves of rapes that have been associated with political violence, in recent years, um, in the past year, many of those rapes have changed and become indiscriminate of all ages. <clears throat> this is an example of, this is a drawing done of prisoners who were escaped. Just yesterday, I met a young girl, a toddler, who had been a victim of rape. But that's not where the story ends, and for the women, that's not where the story ends. They're dealing with this on a daily basis, but they're working to change it. They've organized, they've held meetings, they've held protests. This is the first meeting of Kofa Viv that I attended. 100 women living underneath, the t uh, working underneath this tent to talk about what the problems were that they were facing and how they're going to change it. After all, what would you do? You go to the police and they say that they don't care and they don't have the resources to change it. You ha have a tent where you can't lock the door. So they're starting with low-tech solutions. They've been distributing thousands of whistles across the camps, training women on how to use them. They're using their mobile phones to organize those meetings and those protests and to advocate for change at the, both the local and international level. They've been, they've been uh, using different technologies as well, forming security patrols of both men and women that have gone into the camps and patrol at night. Despite the attacks that those, that those people face, they've been able to help reduce the number of protests and uh, the number of rapes and respond to the problem. <laughs> and then they've been organizing, we've been helping them take photography, put up, um, put up different exhibitions, and a petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And then just last week when I was in Haiti, we were working to set up a digital bat database for taking the thousands of entries of intake forms that they have, turning it into a digital database so that those incidents can be mapped and the data can be sent to the Ministry of Women's Affairs and the Ministry of Justice. That's linked to a call center that we're setting up so that the women who are experts on the psychosocial support can be responding to women who live in camps where there aren't agents already and they can reach more victims. And then that will all be mapped on NULA, which is a Haitian-built platform very similar to Ushahidi that's been tracking problems in Haiti since the earthquake. And with the aggregation of all of the different grassroots organizations and the data that, they're, that they have collected, we'll be able to petition the Minusta police force, the military, uh, the Minusta, and the local police to better patrol the camps where the cases are the worst. So the question that I pose to all of you is what can you do about it? 
we're here in New York, it seems like a world away, but actually technology helps us, helps bring the, the problem closer to us. We've set up a blog where the women are blogging in Creole that's translated into English at fompale.blogspot.com. Fompale means women speak in Creole. And the most meaningful thing you can do just right now, just tonight, tomorrow morning, is log on and post a comment to their blog. Imagine, think of the first comment you ever received on a blog or a tweet that was not reply. Think how it must feel for a woman who one of the first things she's ever done is to set up her blog post. And then we've been working with, uh, with Live With Design, which is a collaborative of designers and strategists who've been helping us set up this website, womenofhaiti.org. If you go right now to womenofhaiti.org, you can donate to our project, uh, the Digital Democracy site, and soon the site will be up for, for you to experience directly in their words and their images and their videos the story of the women that we're working with in Haiti. Thank you.